of the five arts that every human has exhibited. There's music, dance, adornment, visual art, storytelling, and like I said before, dancing is ubiquitous, music is ubiquitous in Africa. So what about adornment? Before we come in, guns blazing, looking from head to toe at what people look like, we should get an overall philosophy in Africa. In Africa, like lots of hot areas of the world, people don't tend to wear clothes, except if their skin is very fragile, in which case they put on a lot of clothes. This philosophy is important when talking about ancient Egypt, because it highlights the way that they were wearing the clothes, that they were not even slightly worried about the sun. As proof of this, the Dinka and other tribes that the ancient Greeks wrote about, who lived by the Nile, walked around butt naked. And that was just part of their culture. But there's a difference between the sun not killing you and the sun damaging your skin a little bit. And because of this, the Africans actually use multiple oils and extracts to try and protect against the sun so they don't look 50 at 25. One of these is sesame oil, which has been used in Africa for thousands of years. But we won't go too deep in what they put on their skin because that's more function than beauty or adornment. And when it comes to adornment, we have to first cut somewhere and say a lot of the tribes of Africa had clothing made of fibers. But what happened was their trade routes were cut off when giant cities were put in the middle of nowhere by foreigners or Africans who became too powerful. And so some places clothing was replaced with natural clothing. And we will see that it's not as simple as the people have always worn this type of clothing. It was in the basic cultural understanding because the people always sort of stayed within the culture and some people of those tribes remained without a higher level or whatever you want to call it clothing style we know that the clothes that the ancient africans wore in south africa or southern africa is different than what they wear today because as it says in the book a journal of the first voyage of vasco da gama from 1497 to 1499, this is pre-Dutch, it says, On the following day, 14 or 15 natives came to where our ship lay. The captain major landed and showed them a variety of merchandise with a view of finding out whether such things were to be found in this country. The merchandise, including cinnamon, cloves, seed pearls, gold, and many other things but it was evident that they had no knowledge whatever of such articles and they were consequently given round bells and tin rings this happened on friday and the like took place on saturday on sunday november 12th about 40 or 50 natives made their appearance and having dined we landed and in exchange for the seattles with which we came provided, we obtained shells, which they wore as ornaments in their ears, and which looked as if they were plated, and foxtails attached to a handle with which they fanned their faces. I also acquired for one Seattle one of the sheets which they wore over their members, and this seemed to show that they valued copper very highly. Indeed, they wore small beads of that metal in their ears. As you can see with this example of the Bushmen, 
which they call the heart and tart back then, which today is considered offensive. They have copper on their sheaths, which is like a bag that covers your genitals as a man. And if you look at the balls that he's talking about in the ears, those are made of copper, which talks about metallurgy in a, in a different way rather than just taking some copper and putting it on a sheath. And thirdly, this shows that they probably had contact or trade with other people. But more than this is that this is only one tribe they met on November 2nd. In the same November, they met another tribe of the same, let's call it race, of hot and tart Bushman people. But since we're talking of adornment, let's go straight to Rio de Cobra, which is the place of copper. Or Terra da Boa Genta, the land of good people. He says, this country seemed to us to be densely populated. There are many chiefs, and the number of women seem to be greater than that of men. For among those who come to see us, there were 40 women to every 20 men. The houses are built of straw. The arms of the people include long bows and arrows, spears with iron blades. Copper seems to be plentiful. For the people wore ornaments of it on their legs and arms and in their twisted hair. Tin likewise is found in this country, for it is to be seen in the hilts of their daggers, the sheets of which are made of ivory. Linen cloth is highly prized by the people who were always willing to give large quantities of copper in exchange for shirts. They have large calabashes in which they carry seawater inland, where they pour it into pits to obtain the salt. Well, there's a lot to explain here. This place in Mozambique was inhabited, and it was locally inhabited by the Tonga people, or Batonga people. And these people obviously had copper but they had tin and they had other metals like iron as you saw and these people also grew cotton which is why when Vasco da Gama came with the linen they recognized it and wanted to purchase it because they grew cotton and traded it with the Arabs who later would write down the famous people they met on this side who they would purchase local cotton grown by these people also keep in mind their spin the way that they spun this cotton was similar to that of the ancient egyptians as you saw in that other book that i showed you from congo but you don't have to trust me i'll read it out for you in this same book in rio de bonds Signia, which is in Mozambique, he says, The country is low and marshy and covered with tall trees yielding an abundance of various fruits which the inhabitants eat. These people are black and well made. They go naked, merely wearing a piece of cotton stuff around their loins. That worn by the woman being larger than that worn by the men. The young women are good looking, their lips are pierced in three places, and they wear in their bits of twisted tin. These people took much delight in us. They brought us in their almadas, what they had, whilst we went into their village to procure water. When we had been two or three days at this place, two gentlemen of the country came to see us. They were very haughty and valued nothing which we gave them. One of them wore a tuka with a fringe embroidered in silk and the other a cap of green satin. A young man in their company, so we understood from their signs, had come from a distant country 
and had already seen big ships like ours, those tokens gladdened our hearts, for it appeared as if we were really approaching the bourne of our desires. These gentlemen had huts built on the river bank close to the ship in which they stayed seven days, sending daily to the ships, offering to barter cloths which bore a mark of red ochre. And when they were tired of being there, they left in their almadas upon the river. As you can see, there's a pre-colonial African civilization, well, multiple, which were spinning cotton and using it. But more than this, you realize how they're not doing the cotton in a very strange way. They're doing it in a very Africanized way to the point where he calls it cotton stuff because he couldn't exactly place what he was looking at. It was done in a very strange way. Probably a very fine cotton, a very thin one, like the ancient Egyptians would do. But here's what's worse. Now he goes to Mozambique proper. And in Mozambique proper, this is where he finds the most amount of sophistication in these pre-colonial African civilization. When we were again in deep water, we struck our sails and cast anchor at the distance of two bow shots from the village. The people of this country are of ruddy complexion and well-made. They are Mohammedans, and their language is the same as that of the Moors. Their dresses are of fine linen or cotton stuffs with variously colored stripes and of rich and elaborate workmanship. They all wear tukas with borders of silk embroidered in gold. So now I want you to keep this in mind. When you're imagining a Bantu person, do not imagine a person dressed in animal cloths or anything like that. In fact, don't even imagine that of the Khoisan. Imagine these people dressed in beads, dressed in iron, dressed in metals, and also dressed in cotton and other fibers. This is what they actually used to dress like. Now, there were major populations of Bantu people who did not dress like this, who dressed the way that they dress today, like the Zulus, for example. But this is the type of Bantu people that existed and were seen by other people. Keep in mind this being very consistent with other places in Africa. Now there's one item that is very important. When South Africa was first brought in by the Europeans and they discovered gold there, they thought they were the first to discover it. This was not true. There was trade routes of gold going all along the Swahili coast, all the way down to Limpopo province in South Africa. And that gold made it all the way around the world, which made that region very, very rich. And as you can see here, Vasco da Gama states this. There are merchants and have transactions with white Moors, four of whose vessels were at the time in the port laden with gold, silver, cloves, pepper, ginger, and silver rings, also with quantities of pearls, jewels, and rubies, all of which articles used by the people of this country. We understood them to say that all these things, with the exception of the gold, were brought thither by the Moors that further on where we are going to they abounded and that precious stones, pearls and spices were so plentiful that there was no need to purchase them as they could be collected in baskets. All this we learned through a sailor the Captain Major had with him. 
Now, I want to make sure that you guys understand what was said here. It said that there are white Moors who trade with the Moors, the black Moors or the red Moors of the Swahili coast. And these traders trade also with a third population, which is just said as an undertone, which are not Moors, meaning that they are not Mohammedans. In other words, what they're trying to say is that gold is coming from a native people and these native people are not the native Moors. The native Moors get their jewels from just outside and you can see they're saying that these jewels are, are, are bound plentiful in this region and also some of the spices and stuff that there's no point of even selling them because there's so many, right? This is what happens with any product if there's so much of it there's no point of selling it and then he says um except gold which the gold comes from uh the non-moors meaning that the moors trade for the gold because the gold is not plentiful in this region but comes from somewhere inland this we know is true because we find out that the gold in the swahili areas was coming from um, Great Zimbabwe, Mapungubwe, all these other places. By the way, I want you guys to watch my other video, the one that I, I did on the civilizations. And if you connect these two together, you'll realize that I'm talking about the same things. Remember, these this is the 1400s. They go on to tell him about Prester John. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can pause and read it. They go on to tell him about Prester John which means that these people were aware of the country of Ethiopia, which Prester John was said to be. And they mentioned that there are fights between the Christians and the Muslims in that region of Ethiopia. Now leaving Vasco da Gama, we go to through the dark continent where they talk about the cotton use there as well of the native black people. And it says, we rested on Samba Island for the evening of the 27th the islanders told us that there was a cave about 60 yards in length on the mainland opposite where they sometimes hid in time of danger for a small island msamba is densely populated and every inch seems cultivated the islanders are, are clever manufacturers of a strong coarse cotton cloth in another book it says we saw the cotton growing luxuriantly all around the marketplaces from seed dropped accidentally it is seen also about the native huts and so far as i could learn it was the american cotton so influenced by climate as to be perennial we met in the road natives passing with bundles of cops or spindles full of cotton thread and these they were carrying to other parts to be woven into cloth. The women are the spinners and the men perform the weaving. Each web is about five feet long and 15 or 18 inches wide. The loom is of the simplest construction being nothing but two beams placed one over the other. The web standing perpendicularly, the thread of the web are separated by means of a thin wooden lath and the woof passed through by means of the spindle on which it has been wound, wound in the spinning. The mode of spinning and weaving in Angola and indeed throughout South Central Africa is so very like the same occupation in the hands of the ancient Egyptians that I introduce a woodcut from the interesting work of Sir Gardner Wilkins. The lower figure are engaged in spinning in the real African method and the weavers in the left hand corner have their web in the Angolese fashion. You can see here that he sees a similarity between the Egyptian patterns and the other 
patterns and if we didn't have so much other things that are similar between egypt and africa we would dismiss this point entirely but we cannot some of the oldest textiles in africa are in Burkina faso at least the oldest evidence we can find remember textiles just go away with the environment if you leave them on the ground are from 1000 a.d as you can see in this excerpt another group of people who have textiles and they make them out of uh palm palm fibers are the the bakuba kingdom these textiles apply geometric patterns and depending on how it's written these patterns have been used to deduce some historical facts as these were culturally significant symbols and using this many geometric patterns in clothing as you can see it makes for a very intricate design it's not a bakuba thing which is in the congolese area it's not just a bakuba thing i will show you that geometric patterns were used in ancient egypt in west africa in southern africa in east africa as a symbolic thing especially zigzags diamonds triangles these are the type of symbols that were used in order to portray messages in other cultures of course you have geometric patterns but they don't resemble the same thing instead of symbols of writing like the you find in africa they are used in some places as like in arabia as to show mathematical precision so let's start with west africa we already know that west africans used their clothes for symbolic texting or sending messages is more of a better way of saying it the designs in this kente fabric originated from the ashante people in ghana west africa the name comes from the ashante word kenten which means basket because of its woven look the origins date back to the 12th century and this fabric has traditionally been worn by royalty kings and queens and other important figures during ceremonial events there are many different designs each design has a different historical philosophical or moral meaning we will look at just two of these now this first design represents aspiration noble deeds or sharing the Ashanti name for this literally means one who climbs a tree worth climbing gets the help deserved the meaning is that anyone who performs a noble deed deserves the support of the community now east africa is one of those regions in africa that maintains a lot of african culture so east africa also has a significance when it comes to the patterns on clothes but east africa because they had writing gears a long time ago they actually preserved what some of these writings meant and a lot of them had to do with magical spells and as you saw with the Nigerian one, a lot of these are omens or let's say miracle type stuff where they're trying to give you thanks or trying to immunize you against something in the natural world. And in Ethiopia, you find this in spades back in the day. By the way, this is from the old ethiopian kingdom we find a book that talks about the difference between just normal patterns and these geometric patterns that are used for casting spells that you put on clothes in order for them to work the short illustrated blog will explore some magic and divination in ethiopian manuscripts and other items such as amulets from the collection making use of images from some of the best examples of the manuscript and amulets scrolls in british library collections as well as containing spells charts magical squares and numbers these manuscripts are adorned with rich illustrations for an introduction to the amulets 
And as you can see, there's all these patterns. And then, of course, because they have illustration, you can write something. And, of course, they have numbers because they had mathematics. It's a text written in Giez, an ancient language of Ethiopia. If you wish to turn into a lion or transform yourself into a lion, read the above prayer and write it on a silk cloth and tie it around your head. Or if you wish to be a serpent, write this and tie it on your wrist. Events have been recorded. So my final theme for my little natter today has to do with the presentation of images. There's another glorious picture of um, Archangel Michael. And what I really like about these images is that he's multi-armed. Okay, so we have two arms up here fighting the demons, and yet there are other arms down here holding kind of another sword. As I mentioned previously in relationship to thinking about geometric designs, we need to be careful of automatically bringing our contemporary scopic regimes, that is, our everyday ways of viewing things, to look at texts and images um, produced in quite different cultural contexts. Like much ritual image culture, images in this context have agency, that is, that they're attributed a liveliness or a capacity to do stuff. They are magical. That is, they're imbued with a power whose source is considered to be otherworldly or metaphysical. So they are not illustrations or harmless diagrams. Now, this is a very different way of thinking about images. We might be familiar with images affecting us emotionally, bringing us joy or happiness or rapture or arrest, looking at all those cat images on the line in the middle of the day, or peacefulness or something like that. But it's a less familiar idea, um, that, the idea that the images can either be, one, ontological, that is, that they can actually be the being. Okay? That is, they're not a picture of a particular spirit being um, that it looks like, but it actually is that being. Okay? The spirit being taking up residence or is formed by the image. And secondly, that the images are capable of direct action, which affects the person or people directly. So for example, they can heal an illness, they can make them full of lust, the love magic, I'll give an example of that later, or they can do much nastier things, which I won't be talking about. As you can see, cloth and patterns, geometric patterns, are said to be very influential and very linguistic and very alive, as I showed you in the kente cloth. But I will also go back to West Africa because we need to address the magical elements of these patterns in West Africa. But we shall read... And in a study, it says, Scrolls are often carried with people, hung by string. Women must not wear them during menstruation or after sex. Scrolls under the pillow can stave off nightmares. They assist deep breathing and prayer. They seem to be refreshed by having the priest read the scroll on a visit. Sometimes scrolls are put on the certain central post of a house facing the door as you can see on the manuscript there are people wearing white cloth and they have borders around them these borders are not merely just borders a lot of them again would be spells or st stuff like that but then some of them were merely documents a pre gayer's way of writing and this writing can tell you about historical events rank power all kinds of things, just like the other African cultures. And you can see there that these are geometric, geometric patterns. Very common, these squares, these diamonds. This clearly has a Christian bend to it with all these crosses. Or an Ethiopian Christian bend with all the crosses. Because the crosses of this kind existed in Ethiopia prior to Christianity letter itself it's called utate it means take me so this is the first love letter that the girl will have to make to the boy after proposing for many times and then at the end the girl agreed and then, and then each color on top it's, that's where the letter is that's where all the message is and then the triangle facing down it's a symbol of men so the lady, she's saying, you are man enough to be my husband. And there's another letter. The second letter, it's called 
a love letter as well, but it's got a special name called Itsemba. It means my hope. And then it's got the designs, those designs, it's called shield design. So it means uh, the woman is saying here, you are my hope, so I am protected since I've got you as my loved one. And then the third love letter is the two triangles. That yes, only look at me, not to other ladies. Mm -hmm. So I've decided that I love you and uh, you have to look only at me. That's why those things are facing each other. And how about the colors? Uh, the colors, uh, you've got the green. And uh, in this case, like she is saying, I know that you're not with me, working far away, but I'll wait. Green is a symbol of waiting. So like if you see water and on the rivers, you saw those stones against the river, because the water keep on bumping to those stones, they turn into green. So that's how they use green as a symbol of waiting, because like you, wherever he left, uh, wherever he left the, uh, the woman, she would just be there until he comes back from the white people where she would be work, he would be working in. Why that's, I'm saying that's, that's working on the white people, because it's got the orange, which means Iputugezi. So in Zulu, we transfer it as Iputugezi as white people, because those were the people that we normally, our fathers and grandfather would go to Jobek or Deben to work in mines with them. And then the, the blue color, it's symbolizing of uh, missing someone, she would be missing the one that she loved, but what can she do? Hmm. She will wait because she's there to work for the family. And then the final love letter, which is on top. Um, that was the latest love letter that she made when they start like putting words now like alphabets. Izazi are the wise men. So she is referring to his husband as one of the wise men and uh, she will always love and wait for her, right. for him. Yeah. And the other love letter, which is dimensional, shows the man and the woman. Uh, it's uh, uh, mar it, marriage. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, and it's got those triangles also that you see on that love letter. It's more like emphasizing that, yay, yeah, when I said, look only on me, and then it's uh, on a euphobia, tree design. So it's a, it's a special uh, design that common from the area of uh, Ishowe and surrounding. And we have installed the love letters from earliest to latest, bottom to top, which is the way they would be worn. Yes. Like the Ethiopian one, when the Europeans got to Africa and they found these symbols, some of the people became educated in reading and writing in English or in English symbols. And as you can see with this Zulu pattern and translation, it has the word Izazi, which means knowledge or knowers. And this is the reason why this pattern is not that popular anymore because most people became literate in Africa. And so they didn't need you know, a thousand beads that would cost them their entire life in order to send letters anymore. The colorful beadwork made and worn by all Zulu girls is far more than just a charming decoration. For a whole secret language lies behind the arrangement of these bright colors and gay patterns. Messages of constancy to an absent lover or of reproach to a faithless suitor. All the schemes and plans of a designing Zulu maiden. To the observant of you, you will notice that the kente cloth, the Zulu beads, the Kuba Kingdom graphic designs on clothes, and the Ethiopian borders that have these zigzag triangle patterns, they have this computer look about them, this digital look about them. And the reason why they have this is because of a true dedication to accurate geometry. And because of this accurate geometry, it looks like it's designed by a computer. It almost looks pixelated, but this is due to geometry. This is true African similarities. And in Egypt, it's just everywhere. Due to the repetition of these patterns, they create a fractal pattern. And as you can see with the Ethiopian crosses, 
they look like four fractals just fractaling out of each other but again this is a digital or a graphical feature that is common within all these cultures and as you can see it's not just held down in fabrics it's in talismans it's in all kinds of things that you would put on your body and that's the kind of the key to put it on your body so that it works on you bakuba textile designs are excuse me bakuba textiles are a medium for a visual symbolic language which communicates cultural ideas through artistic expression their raffia cloth textiles weave together this society through the cloth's utilitarian, economic, spiritual, and social functions. Now that we understand the functions of raffia cloth, let's take a closer look at the inventive designs for which the Bakuba are particularly known for. I will discuss the design's origins, formal elements, styles, and their symbolic significance in this African society. Bakuba textile designs were born of several influences, really taking shape over their long history as something unique to the Bakuba. Bakuba designs are akin to the flow of music and dance with rhythmic play of shape and line, accentuated form and unified pattern, all balanced within their spatial complexity. All of this is intriguing, but it is the formal, qual formal qualities of the design which elevate these textiles as exceptional works of art. Patterns are produced from the manipulation of three elements, that is line, color, and texture. Line is used to create shape and give the feeling of movement within a piece. Shapes are almost always geometric and rectilinear favoring triangles, lozenge shapes or diamonds, and rectangles. The predominant color, the predominant colors used, um, and this is throughout Central Africa, are white, what is called white, it's actually beige, but we, they, it's referred to as white. So we have white, brown, black, and red. Though these colors do have symbolic meaning, It is not the range of, which, of colors which is most important, rather the proximity of contrasting light and dark hues. And I've used um, this textile here as an example of that from Molly Shepard's collection in homage to Africa. It might be my fo most favorite textile in the collection. Texture variations are used to create visual depth and diversity within a piece. A strong sense of composition allows the embroiderers the freedom to play with these three elements and achieve inventive designs while maintaining overall unity. There are three trends in Bakuba design, one which is based in numbers, in which the Nagongo excelled, and whose style is more concerned with defining measured structures than with artistic expression. However, I think it's a good representation of the, um, of the sort of measured numerical structures. The second design trend in which the Shua excels focuses on visual effects that trick the eye of the viewer. Distinct among Kuba textile designs are that of the Royal Bouchon, which aim for perfect pattern symmetry and attend to a sober, excuse me, a sober, conservative, and hierarchical structure, which mimics the values of their political system. Now that I have detailed the formal qualities of these designs, I will discuss, excuse me, I will discuss their role in a greater cultural context. Bakuba design must not merely be reduced to its decorative function. According to Moraga, textile arts ultimately represent Bakuba's most versatile, dynamic, and imaginative form of visual expression, and the most important medium for an abstract visual language. Raffia cloth textiles communicate these cultural ideas and concepts through their embroidered design. The visual language that Moraga refers to is the summation of a body of symbols and patterns and each may be interpreted in multiple ways. Pattern names fall into three categories. The first are names which commemorate in a famous individual or the creator of the pattern. The second, 
pattern names which refer to a part of an object, such as the foot of a chicken. And the third and most abstract naming category are pattern names which refer to the activity of an object. For example, the use of interlocking hooks to symbolize the act of hugging your child. Some of Bakuba design, textile designs fall into, the, fall into a language of patterns called the script. The script is considered a women's language and follows paths, circuits, and systems to express cultural concepts and ideas. The script is used in both textile arts and female scarification practices. According to Georges Morant, a Dutch artist and scholar well-versed in Central African textile design, it can be said that design is a mode of thought which cannot be put into words. As you see there, there are so many similarities between the Ethiopian script, the Zulu beadwork, the West African patterns, cloth patterns, that it's just uncanny from geometric shapes and all this other stuff. And of course, because there's an underlying mathematical thing to ge geometry, these geometrical shapes have to do with some kind of mathematics. Now, Euclidean geometry cannot create fractals, and these geometry patterns always create fractals because of, you know, if you just copy one side to the other and then you do it over and over again, you start to get fractals. And this is not a small thing. This means that all of these fall under the same geometric style. Um, the beads are placed in different parts of the body. Certainly the head is decorated as we're going to see with uh, some of the crowns that indicate their role as a priest or a priestess. And then we'll know that they are a priest or a devotee of that divinity because of the color combinations. And this gets into Yoruba concepts of uh, chromatics, of color, symbolism, color, intention. The Yoruba have three categories of colors. The hot colors, known as the pupa colors, uh, reds and bright yellows. These are the hot colors. At the other extreme are the cool colors, the tutu colors. And that, for the Yoruba, is white. White is coolness, it's supreme coolness. So we have the hot colors at one end. With that kind of introduction, let's take a, let's, let's talk about the robe. Okay, do you have a uh, question for me? To the, to the back mm. or leave the front? Now, let's leave the front for now. Okay. And then we'll, we'll talk about it. So um, these, uh, this is a royal um, beaded robe for uh, a, a king by its size, probably a king, not a queen. Um, and it's got a whole series of these triangular motifs in panels that you're seeing, um, along with uh, these uh, concentric circles. And the concentric circles, I think, are a kind of um, um, an, a, a, a reference in a larger sense to the Yoruba notion of the universe as um, a gourd, an, an enclosed gourd, which one half is the spiritual realm and the other half the, the worldly realm. And those are the things that a ruler uh, has to deal with social matters as well as spiritual matters. Um, we also see a series of concentric rectangles on one side. Of this geometric style might lie at the bottom of the ancient Egyptian writing system, which would be understandable to show why it was so different than all the other writing systems from around the world. And then secondly, it will also help us these African symbols to decipher why other ancient Egyptian jewelry and makes have strange patterns all over them that seem to have no meaning, that seem to just be a interlocutor design where you just go, oh, that's a cool design and you move on. Maybe there's a message there in the back that would have been understood by a more, let's say, uneducated person who wouldn't be familiar with hieroglyphics or the hieratic script. And so he would still have some level of communication.